Hello and welcome to the Charmed Life Podcast. I am your host, Trisha Carr. This podcast is all about magic, metaphysics, mysticism, the unconditional love of the universe, and how you are a very magical being of light. Yes, that's right. Beings of light. That sounds like angels. And well, that's what this episode talks about in uh, many ways, because I am welcoming on Damien Eccles, author and ceremonial magician. Damien was on the program several months ago at the time that this is being released. And so Damien is the author of a few books. One is High Magic, which I highly recommend. And I even say, like, read High Magic and then read Angels and Archangels, A Magician's Guide. One of the things that we are going to talk about is a program, a course that Damien is offering right now with Sounds True. It's an online course, and it is the Royal Science of Angels. And so this is a practice. And he's going to be teaching the Royal Science, Science of Angels, magical practices to be able to channel light into your life and to work with these cosmic intelligences, which we know as angels, really these celestial intelligences, beings of light. It's the same kind of light that composes the stars. And actually, that which composes the stars composes you. So being able to channel that in the ways that humans work and with our symbolism, with our, uh, our imagery and our rituals, and to be the masters of those, to be the sovereign experience in that practice. So that's where we are. And Damien and I talk about, in this episode, we talk about the age that we're in right now, moving from the Piscean age to the Aquarian age, and what that means for you as an individual and us collectively. But Damien and I both love to talk about the symbolism and the metaphysics and the spirituality in this sacred text created by humans that we call the Bible. And in a way that isn't specifically Christian, because neither of us think of ourselves as that kind of religion in any way. Anyway, it is it, it, Damien is just such a powerful uh, vessel of light and knowledge and wisdom, and and you can just really feel his enthusiasm about this work, working with energy, working with angels, working with light, and is so generous in giving that information because that's truly in alignment with where we are, this age that we are in now. It's about sharing. It's about the collective advancement or ascension. So having said that, check out this episode. Here we go with Damien Eccles. Welcome back to the program, Damien Eccles. Such a pleasure, such a joy, such a blessing to connect with you as we did last time on your book, um, is uh, Angels and Archangels, The Magician's Guide. Is that, did I remember it right? That is it. <laughs> I got it. That's okay, it. cool. <laughs> and of course, you are also the author of High Magic. Yes. And you have a program coming up in just a day or two as the time that this is being brought, being published and broadcast. And it's with Sounds True. So those are a lot of things we want to talk about. But in case people have never connected with your work, why mm -hmm. don't you just talk a little bit about what it is that you do, if you don't mind? Uh, I guess what I do, my first love is ceremonial magic, like mm -hmm. traditional ceremonial magic. Uh, you, there are a lot of uh, different religions and spiritualities and belief systems out there that incorporate like aspects of ceremonial magic into their, you know, religious practices. Mm -hmm. But what I do is more about focusing on the what works, why it works, how it works and how we can make it work better. Uh, you know, this one of the mottos of people who do this work is the aim of religion, but the method of science. Yes. And that's so, sort of what we're trying to figure out. We're trying to uh, figure out how to restructure our consciousness so that we are capable of the achieving the most, our, our highest potential. You mm -hmm. know, it's sort of like what Beethoven said. He said, you know, the greatest thing that we could aim for is to approach divinity as closely as we possibly can, gather its rays, and then disseminate them out to mankind. And that's sort of what we're doing whenever we're practicing ceremonial magic, is trying to accumulate as much divine energy around ourselves as possible 
so that you have an effect on everything that you come in contact with. Mm -hmm. And it's almost literal as to how Beethoven, ex you know, to capture that, you know, divine to us, we always equate it with, and in, in, in sacred writings, it's light. Mm -hmm. And so we, we tend to have this idea of bringing light into our energy, that yes. that purity of light, and even allowing it to crystallize. And that's what magic does a lot, ceremonial magic does. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what it is. I mean, a lot of people uh, that aren't trained in any energy development or any energy techniques, the only way they can, uh, uh, they know to accomplish those things are through the act of like receiving communion. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're doing when you're like going into a Catholic church and receiving communion the priest is literally invoking the light into the communion so that every time you take it you're absorbing it more and more into yourself mm -hmm. whenever you're doing magic you're doing the same thing only you're sort of being your own priest mm -hmm. and it's like we can bring that magic in through uh, if we kind of look at the triune being the body mind spirit it's kind of a good model and that's of course what is represented in the Christian religion of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's the same same kind of model. So with the communion, the communion itself would be, it is physical because mm -hmm. you're actually taking a physical element in. Yes. And then he's invoking the uh, energy or the light into it. So that's the mental, emotional. And mm -hmm. so there are different ways. And I heard you speaking about on one of your recent YouTube videos about being able to, the, a lot of people who are uninitiated or unawakened, as a lot of people might think of it, spiritually unawakened or um, even dead, if we want to call it that, um, right. that they only know how to take it in by their physical body. We only know how right. to eat and, you know, and then the expressing of it too is with the physical body. So that could be speaking, walking, connecting, you know, physically yes. expressing it. But that leaves us void and all humans are body, mind, and spirit. So um, it, that's magic tends, it, it, and magic does a lot of physicalizing. So it does serve the triune being, right? Would you exactly. say? Exactly. Well, that, you know, a lot of times when you're doing magic, you okay. have to give it a physical point that it can ground itself into the physical world in order for, you know, anything to take place on this level of reality. Okay. Like when you're doing magic, when you're performing magic, you're operating on several different levels of reality simultaneously. You know, like when you're visualizing, you're using the mental level. When you are doing like Christ says in, in uh, the Gospel of Thomas, when he says, whenever you ask for something, try to make yourself feel as if it's already come to pass. That's the emotional level. So you're, con you're using your, your mental level. You're using the emotional level. You're using the etheric or astral level by the energy that you're taking in and putting into what you're doing. Uh, but you want to, if at all possible, you want to try to incorporate the physical world into the act also, because then you're hitting every single level of reality at the same time. And it makes it even more, more powerful. You know, you can technically do magic with nothing, no tools, no implements, no anything. You know, that was how I had to learn it in, in prison. One of my teachers called it the open hand or the empty hand technique, mm -hmm. you know, because there's no incense or, or candles or anything at all in there. It's you, your energy, and that's it. So, but if there is uh, something that you can use physically, you're just adding that extra level to what you're doing that makes it even more potent, more powerful. It's like the embodiment. It's, you know, we, it, I actually, I actually may have even told you the story on the last time we talked about it. It comes up every now and again um, that, you know, I had this, uh, this um, nature elemental guide who was telling me that I, I couldn't, I couldn't ask for any, or I shouldn't be asking for anything more until I picked up the limes on the ground. And I literally had limes from my lime tree on mm -hmm. the ground, but it was mm -hmm. also, you know, it was symbolic. And he was saying, mm -hmm. you've been given enough. Uh, you know, you've been given enough abundance of spirit or light, mm -hmm. and you need to now embody that. You need to take action to that. And however yes. much we are channeling that through just the mental, emotional, through just the spiritual, it's not going to, it's going to come to naught lest we physicalize it, embody it, or integrate it into the physical realm. And that, yes. that takes our cooperation. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that, and it, once again, if you go back to the Bible, you see that same thing being taught 
by Christ over and over and over, you know, in situations where like when he was healing someone, sometimes he just healed them straight off, you know, Mm -hmm. just did something and sent them on their way. Other times he did the exact same thing. He would tell them, you know, you have to go bathe in this river at this time, or you have to go in this pool, or you have to go do this, or you have to go do that. He would a lot of times give them some sort of physical practice or physical element that went along with whatever else he was doing. And one time it, he he like made a salve of mud or something like that yes, to heal a yes. blind person. Yes, exactly. Yes, it says he spits in mud and then puts mm-hmm. it on a blind man's eyes and then mm-hmm. tells him go wash it off mm-hmm. and the man can and the man can see. So you and I, I we love to talk about symbology in the sacred text that we know as the Bible and you know of course it's just I think one of the sacred texts that has come through mankind. Um, and it, so I, I'm sure some people are thinking like, wait, if they don't know you, um, is he Christian? If they don't know me, they're like, are, is Trisha Christian? You know, and personally, I, do, I don't identify with that label, although I did used to when I was probably the first 20 years of my life. And the main reason I don't identify with that label is because it's something that was created, you know, well after <laughs> Jesus Christ <laughs> lived. Right. So, you know what I mean? Right. It was a religion and a, and a label that was created after that. And just the right. thought form that might be kind of woven in with that, I personally don't find useful. I don't say that there's anything wrong with it. Actually, my best friend and business partner identifies as Christian, albeit very esoteric and you mm-hmm. know, metaphysical in her, um, you know, as a qualifier to that label. So how about you? What is your background with this sort of Western sacred philosophy of the Bible and Jesus and all of that? I don't really, you know, it's one of those things where you'll hear me talk a lot about the Bible because Mm -hmm. the Bible is incredibly interwoven with the history of magic. You know, for example, you'll hear people sometimes say that certain stories in the Bible, like say, you know, one of the big ones, uh, Noah and the Ark, Mm -hmm. they'll say, well, this story is just plagiarized from older Sumerian cuneiform tablets. Well, it's not that it's plagiarized. It's that it is meaning to convey the same information as those tablets were. You know, it's like the next step in the process, carrying it through history. So it's not like they're, they're copying it per se. It's like they are trying to teach you the exact same techniques, principles, philosophies, and everything else that these older scriptures were. And, and, you know, just one example, like uh, you know how um, up until Moses in the Bible, I think there's eight generations of people between like Adam and Eve and mm-hmm. Moses. And it's the same thing in like the Sumerian kings list. Uh, keep in mind, you know, like in the before Moses, you've got all these people that are living for like hundreds and hundreds mm-hmm. of years, you know, like Methuselah and mm-hmm. Adam and all these people. Uh, after that, they go to more human um numbers of of living you know Mm -hmm. like they don't live to be a thousand years old anymore well in the sumerian kings list it's the same thing you see there are eight generations of kings who it says ruled for thousands of years and then after that eighth generation all of a sudden they drop to a human number again Mm -hmm. so that we know we're talking about people Mm -hmm. so it's the same information that's been passed on but you have to keep in mind also a lot of these techniques up until very, very recently in time, were not given or meant to be consumed by the masses. You know, you have to keep in mind that most people could not even read or write until really, really recently. You know, the only way you were going to be able to do those things is if you were either born into a royal family or a very, very wealthy family who usually had connections to royalty in some way. So when you're looking at the Bible, that's why you see, I mean, the especially the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a book written by kings, for mm-hmm. kings, about kings. There is nothing in there for the, the, that's meant to be accessed by the average person. The whole point of Christ in the New Testament was to take those things that had been you know, exclusively held by the elite and make them available to anyone, make mm-hmm. them available to everyone. And you know, that's kind of You know, I I, I talk about this and I went on a long rant just now, but for me, I I don't really ascribe to any religion whatsoever. I would not even remotely consider myself a religious person, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that I don't uh, receive and and derive tremendous amounts of knowledge, wisdom, and benefits in all different ways from these these scriptures. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting to say that it's plagiarized. 
quite literally, there was no such thing as plagiary <laughs> because <Yes. laughs> there wasn't very much written history. They just it belonged to everyone. It was just exactly. knowledge. Yes. And so exactly. this person was writing it down now. So. Yes, they were doing, you know, when we, when you say that someone plagiarized it, you, you're saying it almost as if it was like a malicious intent. Right. Yeah. But whenever these people did this, they had one intent and one mm -hmm. intent alone. And that was to pass this information to future generations so that they could use it. There wasn't anything, you know, selfish or uh, malicious or anything else in, in their intent when they were doing that. They weren't going to make any money off of it. You know, exactly. like, a, like, yes. like someone who would play, it's like, we're, we're projecting our my our, our con, uh, construct onto a, you know, a historical past that's completely exactly. different reality. Yes. What do you think was the shift between, you know, those eight generations and then suddenly there's no longer the thousands uh, of lifespan. Is that symbolic or do you think that, there was yeah, literally a change I, I in the think bloodline? You're mm -hmm. technically talking about astrological phenomena whenever oh. you're, you're judging. The, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about when you're looking at the Bible, you're mm -hmm. reading about astrological phenomena. For example, you know, Jesus and the 12 disciples are the sun and the 12 constellations of the Zodiac. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever you start to read it like that, you start to see that, Essentially, you know, in magic, for example, magic now varies from science in that modern day science believes that we are constantly gaining new information. Mm -hmm. Magic, on the other hand, looks at it as if we are constantly losing information. Mm -hmm. Like these past generations, these past civilizations understood things so much on, on, on a so much more profound, deeper level than we do now. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff has been lost, but when you're, you, you start to notice that it's talking about cycles a lot of times, mm -hmm. you know, we know, for example, that as the sun moves through the course of the year, it, it passes through the 12 constellations of the Zodiac. Mm -hmm. What people don't, a lot of people don't know. I didn't know this, you know, maybe other people do. I dropped out of school when I was in junior high school. So this was something that was not known to me. I didn't realize there are bigger cycles that the sun goes through also, which is what all of these old monuments and temples, you know, everything from Stonehenge to the pyramids of Giza to, uh, you know, the temple, the Buddhist temple in Angkor Wat, all of these things had to do with this, you know, they were mirrors of this astrological phenomenon. Um, but for example, the sun, the second, uh, pattern that it creates or the second cycle it goes to, well, the third cycle, the first cycle that the sun moves through. And, and the reason I'm talking about this, I realize it may bore the hell out of some people. I don't think but, so. Not my audience well, <laughs> and you. not your audience. You also can watch it. <laughs> well, when you're doing magic, you are basically aligning your consciousness with solar consciousness with the sun. Yes. So you start off the first rituals that you learn are based on how the sun moves through the course of the day. It rises in the East hits its high point in the south, begins to set in the west, and is gone in the north. So that's what you're doing. You're aligning your consciousness with that. The next higher level would be aligning your consciousness with the sun as it moves through the pattern of the year, the astrological signs. Mm -hmm. Well, above that is what they call the great year, where, and this is why ancient cultures pay so much attention to uh, the spring equinox, what the great year is, is if you stand facing east at the time of the spring equinox, you will see the sun rise in the same constellation of the zodiac for between 2,000 and 2,500 years. Mm -hmm. So, for example, at the time of the ancient Sumerians, uh, that's when it would be rising in the sign of Taurus. When Judaism was becoming the predominant religion that was spreading through the world, that's when it would be rising in the sign of Aries. When Christianity became the dominant religion that started to spread like crazy, that's when the sun would have been rising in the sign of Pisces. Now we are on the cusp. We're passing from Pisces into Aquarius, which is exactly what Christ was describing whenever he told his disciples, he said, I'm going to leave you. Mm -hmm. They said, what do we do whenever you leave? He said, follow the man with the water pitcher into his house. And in those days, men did not carry water. That was considered feminine mm -hmm. work. That was entirely women's work. However, the sign of Aquarius is a man holding a water pitcher. So basically what he's telling them is you're going to go from Pisces, the sign of the fish, into Aquarius, the sign of this, this water bearer. And, you know, there's a, when, you know, a lot of this may sound crazy, but for example, whenever I first 
began studying the Golden Dawn tradition of ceremonial magic, one of the things that I came across, and I did not understand what this meant at the time, but it said that if you completely master this system, you will be the equivalent of what the Old Testament calls a prophet. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what that meant. You know, I thought a prophet is somebody who like sees the future. Mm-hmm. It, what they meant, they a prophet is not someone who sees the future. It's someone who understands the past and is able to see these cycles and understand where they're going to go. And it yeah. gives you more of an idea about where the world is heading. So for example, right now, as we're going into Aquarius, Aquarius is an air sign. Mm-hmm. Air is all about information. So the new kingdom will be the internet that will be you know the new world the world based on information where everybody lives at and so just looking at those ages thinking of like you said the bible was written by kings for kings and the common person it it would be like giving a child a really sharp knife because there wasn't they weren't complete enough but now everybody has information everybody has the potential but i still think we are a little bit like children with knives because we have this technology and to a great degree, we're abusing one another with it. You know what I mean? Like, yes. So we need to grow into what it is. Absolutely. We well, need I think more a lot of it may be because, in some ways, maybe we were deliberately stunted. You know, maybe mm-hmm. some of the stuff was deliberately held from us just mm-hmm. to keep us in a fearful, superstitious mm-hmm. kind of mentality. Because mm-hmm. when you are in that kind of mindset, when you're vibrating at the frequency to use that terminology of, of fear and, mm-hmm. you know, all that kind of stuff, you want someone to mm-hmm. come in and tell you what to do. You want a mommy figure, you want a daddy figure, someone who will tell you, if you do this, you're going to be safe, you're going to be okay. So it makes you more reliant on people who want to tell you what to do, who mm-hmm. want to direct the course of your actions. And that was it, like, again, in these older ages, and I would say even some other systems like human design um, observed that we actually went from a seven centered being to a nine centered being. We've like brought on two more major centers around the late 1700s. I can't remember what it was. Mm-hmm. But anyway, you know, it's like it was in a sense necessary because it, once again, you can't give a child the keys to the car. Yes, and exactly. So, Fear. Yes. I mean, unfortunately, that is how children get parented a lot. They are, they are, um, you know, fear is created because they don't have the mental capacity to understand why you can't run into the street. So you have to exactly. like physically yes. inhibit them. But Ex- we're not, that is, that's not what we are. Anymore. Religion is that is a part of that technology, dogmatic yes. religion, and it's antiquated now. It's outdated technology. I exactly. think Jesus was actually trying to get rid of religion. Don't you think? Jesus was trying to say, no, no, no. God is in you. We are yes. all gods. Exactly. Right? <laughs> he says at one point, I can't remember who he says it to, but he says, have, he says something like, have I not said to you that ye are gods? Yeah. You are you know, all gods. These things that I do, you will do an even greater. Yes. Yes. That's exactly. magic. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm, exactly. And even if you look up the very earliest depictions of Christ, you will not see a man with long hair and a beard. You will see a beardless man, short hair, and he will be holding a wand. Even the engravings of him bringing Lazarus back to life mm-hmm. is the earliest depictions show Christ tapping on Lazarus's tomb with a wand to bring him forth. Yes. Jesus was a medium. Jesus was uh, an energy healer. <laughs> Jesus was a magician. He's all yes. of these things that unfortunately a modern, this is again, why I wouldn't associate with re- well, religion. Like I say, I think religion is an outdated technology because generally speaking, at least religion is intended to do that thing, to create a covering over you, to put a, a, um, a sort of sovereignty over you between you yes. and God. Yes. Whereas and so that's why I say it's outdated, because what we can now do is be that that sovereignty ourselves, be the master exactly. and utilize rituals because ritual and which are ways to help us to focus our energy, to manipulate energy and yes. embody it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's what so good at. <laughs> I mean, that's, I agree 100 percent with every word that you just said. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and it. also even that's why like the, the class that's, or the course that yes, starts uh, on course. November 30th, mm-hmm. that was the reason it was called uh, the Royal Science. You know, mm. it's about the Royal Science of invoking angels. And, and people will ask, what, what does that mean, the Royal Science? The Royal Science was all about gaining sovereignty over your own life. You know, not being, 
uh, subject to outward influences and in, in energies that are having an impact on your behavior, on your thoughts, on your actions that you don't even realize are there until you manage to sever those links. And then you realize what a, what a big role outside influences are having on your behaviors and thought patterns and everything else. Yes. Well, we're actually absorbing them. In so, we have so many energy leaks and we have so many inputs into our energy with the way that we receive media now mm -hmm. and we have conditioning that looking at it all the time is going to make us successful or responsible citizens or something like that. And it's there's just so I feel like our energy is under so much attack. If yes. you just, even if you go on Facebook or something, you're scrolling, you may think you're just looking at the post you're looking at, but there are ads on the side and that's going into your energies, mm -hmm. you know, yes. and all these inputs all over the place. And that's just I mean, a minor example. And if example. you think about it also, energy is one of the things I always tell people whenever I'm doing like classes on like basic energy work or anything is how incredibly contagious energy is. Yeah. You know, it, if you... The example that I always give is if you are surrounded by people who are always, you know, like criticizing others or looking at things negatively or whatever it is, you will soon enough find yourself falling into those mm -hmm. same behavior patterns. You know, that's the reason like, you know, going back to the Bible for one second, I don't mean to keep going back to that over and over. But at, at one point, there's a story where Jesus goes to raise a little girl from the dead. Yeah. He does not take all of the disciples with him. He mm -hmm. tells them, stay outside. He only takes two, the two who had the most faith. Mm -hmm. He did not take anybody that was filled with doubt or, you know, people who are going to say, you sure you could do this? You know, she's been dead for a while now. You know what you're doing? This is kind of crazy. He did not take those people in with him. He took the two people that he knew were going to have faith. Mm. And that that's just making me think of also like when you are, working on something let's say you're you have a goal you want to manifest something whatever it is it's it's good to not speak it with it, some other people or maybe any because they will out picture yes. it and they will and they will contribute their energy into it and Absolutely. it needs to stay private for a while does magic teach about that a bit i feel like it and does it does that's yeah. where you know they say that uh like the the magician's motto is mm -hmm. to know to dare to will and to remain silent Mm -hmm. That remaining silent is one of it, it, it falls. It's what they call hermetically sealed. Yes. Like you want to stay hermetically sealed so that you're holding that energy in and it's allowed to grow like a seed and nobody outside is going to even be aware of it a lot of times. So they can't contribute to it or, or affect it in any way. Until that seed actually becomes a sprout and then it then it pierces through the soil and then yes. it fruits and it gives its gift then it's obvious but it's exactly. so strong now that what it has to do is to give so yes yeah exactly yeah and that's what a seed is a seed is hermetically sealed and it has to contain its energy and then it receives from the you know from the ecosystem by mm -hmm. feeling its own energy and which is enhancing its signal and then the ecosystem sends it energy or light and yes and, and then it crystallizes literally and becomes mm -hmm. something new Exactly. And we yes. are nature. <laughs> we, are not, <laughs> we are not just in nature, on nature or like nature. And that's what Jesus kept telling. That's what he was mm -hmm. like, who they don't understand those dusty scrolls. Nobody does. I, I know them, but they're not important. Look at the mustard seed. They know that. And that is the, that is God in, in everything right there. Yes, exactly. And, and using that example, you know, the seed, I think that is uh, an incredibly potent symbol, analogy, metaphor, and it's mm -hmm. a metaphor that you will find used in all of these spiritual traditions. You know, it's the, like the tree of life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's something that came from a seed, mm -hmm. but someone described it to me once as like what we're doing when we're doing magic is imagine an oak tree and tens of thousands of acorns will fall off of this oak tree. Almost every single one of them will degenerate, deteriorate, return back into the earth, become food, sustenance that the tree will reabsorb and use again. And it goes through this cycle. Mm -hmm. Every so often, one of those acorns will fall and take root and become an oak tree in and of itself. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do when we do magic. We are breaking free of that cycle and becoming a tree in and of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I. I <laughs> Have you heard also that squirrels misplace 80% of the seeds that they hide? 
No, they, miss, they don't. They don't have access. They they lose them. Eighty percent of them, <laughs> and they say that's how forests are grown. <laughs> that <laughs> makes sense. They're going yeah. and distributing them, and it's like, oh, dumb squirrels. They can't remember where they're planting. No, they, they're that's just their 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 vessels of divine, and they're just doing the work of divine. <laughs> yes, they're doing their will. They're doing what yes. they're here to do. Yeah. All right, we'll talk about this course. I am so excited about it. It's with Sounds True. I talked a little bit about it in the intro. And tell everyone, because I want you guys to sign up right away. The, being able to spend time with Damien and learn from him is is just so impactful and su such an honor and such a gift. Like you just give so much. I mean, your will is very potent and the energy that you are channeling and is crystallized in your aura is contagious. <laughs> and so <Thank> you. <laughs> talk about how it's structured and what we're doing in it. So what I tried to do with this course, uh, which sounds true, is kind of distill everything that I've learned through my practice with angels, you know, and, and this is another thing that I come back to over and over in magic is I always, when people are first learning these practices, I try to drill into them over and over and over to use angels just because mm -hmm. number one, they are incredibly effective. I have never in, in everything that I've ever explored in the realm of magic, I have never come across anything, any rituals, any techniques, any systems, anything that I achieved or, or experienced the results that I got from working with angels. It was one of those things that just, it changed me forever. It's like when you start working with them, it, it, yes, there's all these, you know, amazing side benefits that you can ask them for, get them to do, you know, like protection or a good night's sleep or pretty much anything you can think of. But at the same time, one of the more meaningful things is how it changes you when you come in contact with them. By working with angels, I was able to experience things in my life that I did not even get out of practicing Zen Buddhism for years. So that was what made me so enthusiastic about it. And usually when people really do settle down and start working with them, they experience the same thing. So they get passionate about it. There's something about, yeah, and, and not everyone in the beginning, you know, don't get me wrong. Like you said, most people now, especially in circles that we move in, like spiritual circles, if you want to call it that, most people do feel like what you were just describing, how religion is an antiquated technology. Mm -hmm. So some people are even really turned off whenever you start talking about angels. I was. You know, I was, yeah. I was on, on death row waiting to be murdered by mm -hmm. people who were calling themselves Christians. So I did, the way I looked at it in the beginning is I did not want to get near anything that even remotely smacked of anything that was of their system. Mm -hmm. What changed it for me was whenever I did start doing some of these practices, the effects that I experienced were so profound and amazing that from that point on, I didn't care who tried to claim these things, you know, what traditions. And of course, you know, later I, I learned that, you know, these things aren't Christian. They're not, yeah. you know, they're not part of Judaism. These things go back to the dawn of human civilization. Mm -hmm. And once again, in the Bible, you know, when you're reading about angels, what most people don't connect over and over and over, you see that when they're describing angels, what they're describing are stars. Yeah. Always, start, you know, even when they're talking about like fallen angels, mm -hmm. like when they're talking about uh, the dragon, you know, we were taught that a third of the angels were cast from heaven. What the Bible actually says is that a third of the angel or, or a third of the stars were scooped out of the sky, thrown down from the earth. And once again, that has to do with like the shift of the earth's pole and, uh, you know, some stars dipping, but like in the Bible, anytime you hear about the abyss, basically what they're talking about is stars slipping down into the, the Southern hemisphere, you know, mm -hmm. below the horizon into the Southern hemisphere. That's the abyss. Mm -hmm. abyss. Um, but, you know, all through the Bible, you see that angels are synonymous with astrological signs, with uh, different stars. So what you're doing when you're invoking angels are invoking the consciousness that is behind those star systems. And, and to some people that'll sound foreign, they'll think, what do you mean a consciousness behind these things? We don't real we, we measure consciousness just like we do everything else, which is almost entirely on the physical level of reality. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. don't take into consideration that there are intelligences 
consciousnesses, entities, whatever you want to call them, that exist on every single level of reality that we do, except for perhaps the physical level of reality. So I forgot where I was going with that. I had a point, but my mind went. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm cruising with you. <laughs> We're talking oh, about how, yeah. but what I found, uh, the, the thing about the realities and these intelligences is that sometimes things that we do not think of as being intelligent at all mm -hmm. have tremendously powerful intelligences behind them. And you have to find ways to unlock them. Like for, and, and that's what meditation does a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Like if you are ever really alone for long periods of time where you have no outward distractions and you fasten your mind onto a concept it's almost like you're turning it over over and over trying to find a handhold a finger hold so that you can understand it a lot of time and this happened to me with math a long time ago when I was you know studying like sacred geometry and trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to draw the tree of life mm -hmm. what happened is when I was so fastened onto the concept of math it's like one day you it's almost like you're looking at it and then one day, you know, to the core of your being that something just opened its eyes and looked back at you, that whatever it is that you are fastening your mind on is every bit as conscious as you are. Maybe not in the same way, mm -hmm. maybe not in a level that you can understand, but you know, there is a sentience there. I, I'm right with you. I mean, I talk to animals and trees and rocks and or even like with the squirrels, we would say, well, the squirrels have a lower grade of consciousness than humans because blah, blah, blah. But no, that maybe they have a and, and to some degree it's higher because they are doing the work of creation mm -hmm. with without having, with, you know, just naturally automatedly mm -hmm. in, in a really yes. beautiful way. I always and, look yeah. at it as as the thing I always try to keep in mind is not, not necessarily even higher or lower, but just different. Different. You know, it's, yes. It's, and a different it's doing input. its job. Yeah. Just like and it's again, ours. like us projecting our construct, like a limited construct onto some other age and saying yes. it was this. And yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. This it's projection almost like thing. when we're looking for life on other planets, you know, mm -hmm. it's almost like people think if there's life on other planets, we're talking about like us, mm -hmm. you know, we're not thinking about a lot of times like bacteria or microorganisms or all these sorts of things that are conscious that are alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same way when we're talking about spiritual things, what, and, and this will sound crazy to some people, some people immediately want no part of it. But if you deal with everything that you come in contact with, as if it is conscious, as if it is sentient, because on one level of reality, it is, you know, everything is made of energy. And, and like you were talking about earlier about how we equate divinity with light. Mm -hmm. There is an intelligence in that light. That's why you don't have to tell it how to do its job. You know, like if you're trying to manifest something, say, for example, you're trying to just, you know, for, for purposes of displaying the, just, just say it's like, you're trying to manifest a new job. Mm -hmm. So you're visualizing yourself working in this job where you're happy, you're content, your needs are fulfilled, you're putting energy, you're putting light into it. You don't have to tell the light step by step how to go about doing that. Yeah. It just does it by itself. Yeah. It's because there is an intelligence in it. May not be the same kind of intelligence that we have, but there is definitely something there. And it may not be an intelligence that's operating on a time frame that we think it should be. <laughs> you know what I mean? Once exactly. again, exactly our projection yes. <laughs> of our, our own oh, limitations think, or perceived limitations. Yes. I think a lot of times stuff like that, you know, the timing and, mm -hmm. and things differing from that, it's almost like, you know, we, again, it's almost like we're children because our view down the road is limited because mm -hmm. we're on a lower say level yeah. than some things that are higher than us. Mm -hmm. So things that are higher than us might be able to see further down the road than we can. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if we're doing it, trying to, to bring about something and it doesn't seem to be working or whatever, it's because whatever can see further down the road, like an angel is directing things to get an even better outcome. That's going mm -hmm. to serve your growth than what you think you want, what you think you need. It's actually in alignment with that, which with your calling, like the, the frequency that you're sending out, we don't really 
know, we don't truly know what that's supposed to look like. And I mm-hmm. say to a lot to my students, what is manifesting is for you and what is not manifesting is for you. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's like that old Garth Brooks song, uh, <laughs> some of God's greatest gifts are oh. unanswered prayers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, oh, so the, so the, uh, the course we're going to talk, it's about the Royal science and working with angels and yes. yes. And so I, tell about it. So it's a couple of days and then there's Q&A. How, how it's going it? to be, you know what? I honestly can't remember right off the top. This is bad. I can't remember if it's ago. six weeks or eight weeks, <laughs> oh, but it's okay, going, super. it's going to be a several weeks long because I, I really did try to put like everything that I've studied, everything I've learned and, and all of my practices concerning angels. I tried to shove as much of it into this course as I possibly could so that people could get it all in one place instead wow. of doing like I had to do and you know, get it here and there mm-hmm. over, you know, a period of many, many years. That's incredible. I didn't, I read about it a while ago. So I'm so, sorry, I did to pardon. I have to correct myself thinking that it was only a couple of days and it starts in a couple of days from now though. Yes. So how long can people, do they have to, it starts on the, on November 30th. Is that the deadline right. to register or can they register a little bit after um, it starts? Do you know? I, I think you can register after that, but the, the thing is some of it will be live you know, mm-hmm. so if you maybe do it later down the road, like after the live events, then you wouldn't get a, a chance to ask questions or, you know, right. if something comes up in your practice that, you know, you need help understanding or whatever, you wouldn't be able to participate in the live ones. You could still watch them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I'm encouraging people to do it. We start on the 30th, November mm-hmm. 30th will be the first day. Uh, and to me, honestly, the most fun part of doing anything like this is always the live stuff, yeah. you know, being able to have the back and forth with people, the Q and a, cause it's like when I'm talking, I already know what I'm going to say. You know, I'm just <laughs> saying stuff I already know, yeah. but when other people are involved in it and can start asking you things, sometimes they take you off in a direction that you didn't see coming in a million years. And it adds something that you had no intention of even, you know, didn't even know you were going to talk about. So that's yeah, always that's- the fun part for me. That's how, yeah, the teacher gets to learn then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> by, by exactly. Questions in the, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, this is, I, again, I just love talking to you and I could, I could keep you for hours, but I, I won't. <laughs> we have the, we have the program, we have your books and is there anything else that you, you want to, any other tips or any, any other uh, wisdom that you want to share before we wrap this episode? Hmm. Or anything that's coming up for you too, besides this program. Are you working on another book? <laughs> I am actually, uh, I Lori and I, my wife, we're working on one together and it ties into something you were talking about earlier. I mean, you, it was like you hit the nail straight on the head when you were talking about rituals, uh, like, like the, the book that we're working on the title right now, it may change as we, the, the theme of it won't change, but we'll mm-hmm. maybe work on the title, but we're calling it rituals. Uh-huh. And the point of it is to, you know, rituals what they're for are to bring us back to using divinity incorporating divinity into every single aspect of our life you know every single thing that we are doing is part of our path it's part of our growth and the more you can incorporate divinity into your everyday life usually the smoother things are going to go so you know we're trying to combine that with like the basic elements of what magic are. Like, you know, there are, you know, hundreds, perhaps thousands of different rituals, techniques, practices in, you know, not only ceremonial magic and witchcraft and new age traditions and all those sorts of things, but usually you can take any of those thousands of practices and divide them into one of a very few categories. Like, and these categories are what you are learning when you're learning magic. For example, you're learning to ground, ground Mm -hmm. energy. You're learning to center, to bring yourself back to here, to the physical body, to the present moment. You're learning how to project or direct energy, you know, to take it in, to push it out, to invoke it in, in whatever way you're doing. And you also learn to shield, you know, because like we were talking about the way to become sovereign is to, uh, kind of stop these outside energies that you don't realize are influencing you. So shielding is an important part of that. It's an important technique. It's a way that you, you know, stop yourself from, they say you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. And that's not just our, 
our food, you know, that we're eating with our physical bodies. That is everything you consume, whether it's the books you read, whether it's the people you're coming in contact with, the music you listen to, the movies you watch, the place you live. So a lot of times in order to get completely and absolutely single focused, single pointed concentration, still, whatever you want to call it, you have to uh, separate yourself from those outside energies, which are always moving. So you're not leaking out that light that you've brought in. I mean, that's exactly. some people have that issue too, besides bringing in energies that don't belong to you. Yes. It's the leaking you, things out. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Before you're trying to not leak it out. Mm -hmm. And you are also um, trying to not take in impurities. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. energetic hygiene or spiritual hygiene. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So mm -hmm. many, I mean, that's the perfect word for it. Hygiene. Mm -hmm. So many practices in magic are like spiritual or energetic hygiene. They are mm -hmm. the equivalent of taking a shower and brushing your teeth. Mm -hmm. And we've oh. never been taught how to do these things. Or what you, it's like, you know, oh, how do you get in shape or how do you get healthy? Diet yes. exercise. Diet yes. is the magnetism of your electromagnetic field or yes. the feeling nature. Yes. And then exercise is the projection of it or the, you know, yeah. So it's as above, Absolutely. so below, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's one of the, I always tell people, you know, even if they say, you know, I'm never going to understand these rituals. I'm never going to be able to do this. They seem too complicated. I tell people it can be as simple as going into an environment where you are surrounded by things that elevate what you mm -hmm. think about. Your life is very, very much going to be made up of what you think about all the time. Yep. So if you're constantly thinking about things that drag you down, or like really mundane, mediocre type things, then you're going to live a life on that level. One of the easiest ways without ever doing a ritual to break free of that and start to rise in consciousness is to surround yourself with beautiful, meaningful things that cause you to think about and be inspired by those instead of the more mundane, mediocre things that we would have been, you know, going to the museum instead of, watching a reality TV show. <laughs> it's a big difference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's exciting. I'm really, I really can't, I'm excited for that. It's a book you said, right? For yes. you and Lori. Yes. That's so yes. cool. Really great. And what's so important to realize about rituals is that we are the master of the ritual. I think that it, while at the same time, we're teaching ourselves the techniques and letting our energy be focused by it. I think that, um, do you find when people are kind of beginning to become initiate, they're like, which one is going to work? Which which mm -hmm. ritual will work? And it's like, well, mm -hmm. it's you that's working. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. That's a yes. tool. Yeah, I, always, I, I tell people that's why someone can be deathly allergic to a peanut while it mm. has no effect at all on someone else is because mm. not only, you know, our physical bodies are mirrors of our energy bodies. And, and just like everybody's physical bodies react to things differently, so do our energy bodies. Yeah. You may experience like an explosive growth of consciousness from a certain practice that I get nothing out of whatsoever. You know, it, it's all, it, it really does come down to it is you, you know, mm. right back to the empty hand technique. It's mm. all about you. Mm. Wow. Well, this is just amazing. Looking forward to that. Everyone know that the we ha we're going to have the links to the books, Damien's books, as but especially the Royal Science. Uh, tell me the title of it exactly again. <laughs> uh, written down in front the of Royal me. Science of Angels, the Magician's Eight. Guide to Invoking Celestial Intelligences. Oof. It's the full mouthful. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. And that's through Sounds True. So we have the registration link in the description. Go check it out. Join us. I will be there as well. I'm very excited. It's, it's, I'm, well, I mean, there's no other word, but magical, right? It's going to be magical. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all the work that you do, Damien, and for your time and for your light. Right uh, back at you. I just appreciate you. And Lori. Thanks, Lori, too. <laughs> She's course. always so same, great. Same to you. I mean, I really do appreciate so much, not just you helping to get the word out about these things, but just having the chance to talk to you again. You oh. know, this is pleasant and fun for me. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, at least as much as I did. I don't know if it's possible to enjoy it more than I did. <laughs> I just love talking to Damien. I feel like I could riff with him all day long. We seem to be working in similar veins and, and you know, have these 
similar interests. And it all just comes into that creativity, that intuitive space, that energetic space. And I just love I just love being able to do this program, this podcast, and that is my big gratitude to you for listening or watching, watching on YouTube or listening on a podcast feed, however it is that you are connecting. Our light is connecting. The energy is contagious, y'all. Energy is contagious. So let's enhance, let's resonate with that energy, that light that serves us. So do check out the links in the description Whether you're listening, if you're listening on the podcast, you're like, I'm driving right now, be sure that when you get to your destination or go ahead and pull over and click the link because Damien's course starts in just a couple of days. I'm going to be there. I'm really excited about it It, because I'm always looking for really great ways to advance, evolve, you know, jumpstart and looking for teachers who are channeling that light. As a teacher myself, I need to be learning all the time. And so when I find a teacher that who's actually doing a class no you know because there's we get teachers through our books and everything and teachers who are doing podcasts and 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 youtube stuff and all that kind of thing but who's actually doing a class like damien's doing i mean that's just that's priceless and speaking of that also uh crystal and i crystal and compton my best friend and my partner uh we are actually about to open registration for the next intuitive intensive, the 2021 intuitive intensive. As a matter of fact, it's so proximate to when this is being released, it may be open. Registration may be open. So do check in the link, the description below for that as well. Can you do both Damien's course and our course? Why, yes, you can. And besides, I don't think they're overlapping anyway. (laughs) So I really encourage you to do both. The intuitive intensive is a groundbreaking, pattern shifting, upgrading, blasting open your psychic intuitive abilities wherever you are it's for it's for all levels of learning it's for serious students and it is an immersive program it is a community based program and that i tell you is oh, that is such a huge part of it being able to hang out with people like how excited i am when i'm talking to damian you're hanging out with people who are of that same mindset growing and excitedly learning as well so you got two things to be able to help to upgrade what it is that you're doing and to be channeling that light that you feel and having it manifest and body integrate and out picture projected into this world because that is your purpose and we want what you got to give thanks for tuning in i love you whoever you are (laughs) 